The little title here is Home to Nowhere, The Dissolving of Decorum and the Leveling of Place. Two abiding interests of mine, even as a preteen, have been language or literature and architecture. I've realized in retrospect that almost everything I've written involves some sense of overlap between these two ideas. On the negative side, my eyes and ears always seem tuned to discord and indecorum or unfittingness in the language scape and design scape around me. That would be an example of how I'm always seeing things around me. That picture. Since college and graduate school, my experience and academic training in broad, the broad contours of classical, medieval, and Renaissance cultural history has made me basically familiar with treatises both in rhetoric, Cicero and company, and in architecture, Vitruvius's On Architecture and Leon Battista Alberti's On the Art of Building, the Renaissance treatise, for example. But only recently, because of my growing interest in the classical Christian academy movement and its curriculum and pedagogy, have I really noted the connection between rhetoric and building consciously noted in classical Christian tradition. Cicero, for instance, writes in On the Orator, quote, and those other lights, if I may so call them, which are derived from the arrangement of words are a great ornament to speech, for they are like those things which are called decorations in the splendid ornamenting of a theater or a forum. Now, did you get that? Rhetorical ornamentation is like what happens in architecture. Uh, the great Renaissance architect Alberti reverses the direction of the metaphor. A quote from him, Finally, I would have the architect take the same approach to the art of building as one might toward the study of letters. So you see, the architect now turns to the rhetorician for as models for how to build a building. Isn't that interesting? Yes. But here I thought it might be painful fun to consider the downside of what I think of as the erosion and dissolution of place and language and how these dissolutions might be related. Okay, so here goes. Two landscapes where erosion is jeopardizing a shared sense of place. So this first part I call displaced persons. Anywhere is nowhere. My observations assume that there are particular actions and dispositions appropriate to particular places. It makes sense to me, for example, to speak of libraries as places properly conducive, as Thomas Cranmer's collect has it, to the work of reading, marking, learning, and inwardly digesting, not only the Holy Scriptures, but all books and essays and poems and novels that shape our minds and hearts and judgment and sensibilities. So there, there, that's the role of a library as it is for me. All aspects of design, from acoustics to furniture to the art that surrounds the school community with a library, can and should play their part in fostering the comportment fitting for libraries. The same goes for every other place where a community accomplishes work central to their calling. Now, is, it, is this sense, do you follow that? In? There, do you think of as a certain comportment of body and behavior in a library? Okay. The other day, as I entered the library of my own Christian liberal arts college, made more library-ish a few years ago by a well-meaning donor, I spotted the usual several students lounging on the dark leather sofas that framed the entry area, their feet propped on the coffee table in front of the propane-fueled fireplace, pecking at their smartphones, chatting, snacking. Now you'll, did you say I'm starting to smile, aren't I? <laughs> I scanned the display of new books surrounding the fireplace, as I always do, and then walked around behind to the bistro, the Starbucksy sort of cafe with specialty drinks and sandwiches and salads and snacks, now a popular hangout not only for students but for faculty and staff. <clears throat> as I stood in line for my iced coffee, I tuned in briefly to the convivial conversations around me, and I fear I'm becoming compulsive about this, counted several dozen likes, as in, I was like hearing my alarm clock and it was kind of like, like part of my dream and then I like, okay. 
in a short patch of kind of like sentences, except few had any traceable grammatical trajectory from beginning to end, and were sort of, you know, like really weedy with filler words. Okay, I, I'm, maybe this is too comical. So, okay. <laughs> Iced coffee in hand, I left the bistro through the reference room with other configurations of leather sofas interspersed among the rows of handsome, low, dark, stained bookcases. Wood, wood, wood bookcases. There, on one of the more prominent sofas, I could hardly not notice a young fellow stretched out from end to end, his sneakers on the floor, his bare feet propped on the far armrest, earbuds in ears, reading a book. And again, this is, I'm describing something. I, I'm not making this up. Okay? Reading a book. At least the action of reading was library-ish, but the overall comportment exhibited well to my sensibilities an apparent disregard for the person who might next sit at the end, hand on the now sweat, sweaty, smelly armrest. I'm thinking of the kid's bare feet on the armrest. But nor was there any reason to attribute willful, let alone conscious, discourtesy to the young man's efforts to be maximally comfortable laid back. Something is wrong with this picture, I sighed. But what is wrong? Okay, and this is, what do you think is wrong with that picture? I'll give you three options. <clears throat> is it the indecorum of the fellow's comportment about which we could expect him to know better if he thought for a moment? in a library of all places, you know? So do you, if you just think that he would know that. Or is it the absence of concern for decorum? That's different. Or is it the absence of any category of decorum operative in the society in which the young man and his peers move and breathe? Actually, do you see, the question is where, and it might be, in, church, in our schools or in many places, at what place do we need to insert our, our concern? Okay, what are we dealing with? So that's the question I'm, I'm asking. Can we still suppose with Alberti, and this is an interesting quote, that, that quote, there can be no one, however surly or slow, rough or boorish, who would not be offended by what is unsightly? God, he imagined there can't be anyone so boorish that you would not be offended by, or be attracted to what is most beautiful. There's Alberti believing that no one could be unresponsive to the ugly or the beautiful. Or does this assumption no longer hold water? So that, okay, I get some hands. Yes, what do you? Right, that, because the soul can be so distorted that it doesn't recognize yeah, the beautiful. Right. Or it's reverted sure. to the wild. Yeah, okay, you're, this is, for me, this is a real question, and you right. picked it up. Where are we in the late, in the state of cultural dissolution? Right. And that means things like you can't just yell at the kid if the kid simply doesn't have the apparatus of reception and response right. to this Imagination area. Hasn't been okay. There's mm -hmm. blocks in the okay. way, eclipses in the way of seeing the beautiful. Seeing the beautiful or the ugly. Yeah, the okay. Ugly. Yeah. Or seeing himself in context of it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, okay. There's no, if the two don't exist, he doesn't see himself in any sort of a responsive posture to those as standards. Mm -hmm. It's all whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is what I'm in good response. That's what we've got to figure out, it mm -hmm. seems to me. Uh, my hunch is that an important interference to our responsiveness to the built environments in which our lives unfold may be the steady erosion in our time of the relation of human action to particular spaces. Mm -hmm. Such erosion diminishes our capacity to discern the decorum or the fittingness, the appropriateness, between the design of space and the actions that appropriately take place in that space. Okay, back to my visit to the bistro for an iced coffee. Very often, some of the students at the tables are working on their assignments, their books and laptops open. But any concentrated focus on such library-like work is repeatedly and willingly interrupted by 
get greetings with friends, waves to professors, and multiple checks of the cell phone when the beep indicates an incoming text message or Instagram or Facebook post. This indiscriminate mixing of different sorts of action has become a defining feature of contemporary life. We speak of the so-called multitasking that, as the, a growing body of studies confirms, weakens rather than enhances our competency and attentiveness in performing any one of those tasks. Late waking students munch on their breakfasts and read the assignment for their next class while sort of participating in the twice weekly morning services of preaching and worship singing in my college's chapel. If we bring our Starbucks coffee cups into the classroom, why not into church? Indeed, to attract seekers or to accommodate the daily needs of the worshipers, many churches bring the coffee shop onto the premises. Now, actually, I have no idea whether I'm offending anyone by saying this, okay? No, but I know Preach exactly what you're talking about. Here. <laughs> okay, I, that's what I'm into. Is this on to something, okay? Mm -hmm. Sacramentally oriented people like me feel a troubled irony in the fact that we arrive in church with a stronger desire for the liquid caffeine with bagel or donut than for the body and blood of Christ received in Holy Communion. The, the disassociation of designed space from de designated action is a defining mark not only of the personal behavior of the young person in the library, but of modern social and civic space in general. And so here are some examples, and I wonder, would you add your own? <clears throat> the central front door of the tract homes of suburban subdivisions is an empty vestige of welcoming when the family actually enters the house through the side door from the garage, or maybe the garage is the central element of the architecture of car-defined suburbia. And actually, I see, I've been struck by this, just the acreage of suburban developments in this very area, and often it's the garage that is the central thing, right? The architecture of town halls often renders them indistinguishable from any other unremarkable anonymous commercial building, which implies what about the relationship between government and commerce? Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about that? If they're the same architecture, what does that mean of, by, about the actions that are performed in them? The sprawling single-floor architecture of public schools built in the last half century often makes it difficult to tell just where the entrance is. It's the drop-off place for the buses to discharge their cargo, not the place where students are welcomed into a peaceable kingdom of learners. Okay, I don't know if that resonates with any of you. Well, if there are fewer and fewer particular places or even site-specific actions whose enactment we protect from interruptions and intrusions, the conditions are not propitious for appreciating the role of artworks in enhancing the actions performed in a particular place, the role that art had until the last two centuries or so, and the subject of my book, Putting Art Back in Its Place. If we snack anywhere and everywhere, if we grab, if you notice that's the verb most prevalent when we talk about our eating nowadays, if we grab a bite on the go, that is if we don't use dining rooms because families seldom dine together, then there's no appropriate place for the painting that reminds us about what dining is all about and inspires us to honor the occasion. I have in mind the paintings of the Last Supper in every monastery refectory, whereby the skilled use of perspectival drawing made the painted wall appear to be an extension of the actual space, transforming the dining hall into an extended Last Supper, drawing the monks or nuns themselves into the place of the disciples. Now, did, I don't, did that make sense? Yeah. We have no place for art in a dining room when there is no dining anymore. So that's that circle that we mentioned before. We need places for artwork, but what if there is no place? Then maybe what we need are paintings that powerfully evoke what happens when we are in community together around a table. So maybe, the, well... Banks are designed to blend in with the, the domestic architecture of the neighborhoods they serve, 
and the telling features of a bank are rendered irrelevant when one can do one's banking anytime and in any place on one's handheld device. And that's the advertising appeal. Now you can make your deposits and transfer your funds while you are sitting at the kitchen counter. I have a real ad in mind for that for one. Okay, you can do that at the kitchen counter or while watching your daughter at her soccer game or sitting in your kid's dance recital. You see where I'm going there. And then the dad is not watching the soccer game. Sitting in class, laptop open, provides as good an opportunity as any for placing that order on anthropology or checking the movie times at the Cinemaplex. A 30-something friend of mine recently posted on his Facebook page. In fact, he's an alumnus of the Orvieto program. And this is beautiful. This is on Facebook. He, he writes, Is it just becoming normal and socially acceptable to scroll on your phone while at the movies? I used to ask people to put their phones away, but literally 75% of everyone in the theater had their phone out this evening. It was a very young crowd. Also, the guy next to me had his, <laughs> had his phone flashlight on for about 10 minutes as he ate. I asked him to shut it off, and he said something about needing the light. Yeah, I just... <laughs> painfully beautiful quote. Oh, boy. Indeed, the ubiquity of smartphones and other portable devices connected to the internet is itself a significant contributor to the leveling of spatial distinctions and the erasure of identity of place. We sabotage real presence with our children at home, during meetings at the office, in a class at school or a conversation at the coffee shop, or in a worship service at church, with a quick check of Facebook or a scan of incoming meals, emails. Now, I'm at, is this what we live in now? Okay, so that's, I'm, I'm not asking that rhetorically. I, is this accurate? I guess I'm interested in feedback, yeah. okay? Students in my home campus, now this is the earth thing, whip out their smartphones as, the ex, as they exit the library onto the path around the beautifully landscaped quadrangle, pecking away with their thumbs the entire way towards grabbing something to eat in the dining hall, oblivious to bird calls, to the colors and smells of the flower beds, and to one another. Actually, that's painful. Gordon, Co well, I shouldn't name the name of my college, uh, has a beautifully landscaped campus now. Mm -hmm. And it just pains me to walk the pathways and nobody is seeing it. Uh, it's that distance from the very earth under our feet. Okay, well, uh, at one Wednesday morning breakfast with my buddies at the local diner, my heart lifted when a father arrived with his elementary age son for a breakfast date. But my hopes for a healthier society were dashed when the dad pulled out his smartphone, leaving the boy to eat his pancakes in silence until he turned to a video to video gaming on his own phone. Yeah, you're. It it so uh, it was it's so sad. Okay. When two or three or more are gathered together in common cause and someone openly or surreptitiously responds to the quietly audible buzz and tunes out even for only 15 seconds to check the call or the message, I mean, is it the action of the whole group is discouragingly violated, rendered secondary and interruptible? Now, again, that's how I experienced that event. Uh, an association of action with place is subverted when anything can happen in that place. But if anything, now I'm moving the argument on a bit, okay? If anything can happen in a place, when we weaken our sense of or confidence in or commitment to the rules of engagement in a particular work fittingly housed in a place, our bodies inclined to go lax because we're not sure what we're preparing for. Hence the default position of slouching, the position of boredom and purposelessness, rather than being poised for action, body ready without uncertainty as to what one might be called upon to do. Although I, uh, no, I'll skip that, but it's another painful example, okay? When, uh, on the other hand, we are gathered together in a place designed to house a collective action, a work of the people, but you folks know what I just defined, which is the simple meaning of liturgy, 
and we and our companions share an understanding of what that action is and of its degree of importance in relation to other possible actions, then we become alert to behaviors and comportments that seem ill-suited to the job. Now, maybe, maybe that was too much. Did he get that? Mm -hmm. Is that when we know the rules of engagement, we can start to make discriminating assessment of what's around us. That's when we can say, you know, uh, son, sit up, okay? Or, you know, but put, take your hands out of your pockets. Or please say hello to the arriving, your, your grandmother or something. Uh, okay, forgive my, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, you know, and we and our companions share an understanding. Anyway, then we become alert to behaviors that seem ill-suited to the job. We can inquire astutely as to how various aspects of the place are conducive or not to the intended action. Here's a parenthesis. Do the arcs of cushy cinema-style fold-down seats in the worship auditorium... You, you see, I'm full of biases here, and I don't know <laughs> if this is offensive. Whose central focus is on the praise band's equipment on the stage subtly, if unintentionally, dispose us towards expecting to be entertained. So I, I probably am preaching to the choir here. Does that, see, so I am saying the place, what's the quote we are, the place shapes how we engage in it. Okay? Okay. We will have an easier time of setting rules and modeling them. That is, if we know what it is we're doing. No cell phones at the dinner table or in any place where your conversation partner deserves to receive your undivided attention. In training the servers for the weekly Saturday breakfast in the church hall for the needier folk in the community, the leaders can say, we want our guests to have an experience like those invited to the wedding feast in Jesus' parable, when those of low status in the world are invited up to the head table. So instead of running our guests through the cafeteria line, we ask each person at the table what he or she would like to have from the menu and serve them their meal with a warm smile, asking them their name until we've learned it. Okay, so that's where, what it is that is the model for what we're doing can then get, get across how we're going to behave. Here I am inviting, okay, I'm done with this. For, here I am inviting us to reflect on the relation between places, the actions they house, and the behavior befitting those actions. My theme is that a dissolving of a sense of place confuses and subverts a sense of decorum, of fitting our comportment to the action. Okay, now I'll pause here, and again, this may be irrelevant for videotaping, but the second, if, you're, if we're interested, the second part is the rhetoric part. Displaced persons speaking, the rhetoric of nowhere. So I have displaced persons, people if anywhere is nowhere if we can and now the rhetoric of nowhere okay i'm going to pause for and any what do you think about these ideas and i i feel like it may have relevance for even our larger conversation here but i'm not sure relevance but the thing that 